Welcome to the Moonshot Podcast, the podcast where we explore business growth, inspire innovative marketing strategies, and explore the world of company culture. Now here are your hosts, serial entrepreneurs and best-selling authors, James Philip Arbuckle and Kane Carpenter. What percentage of second dates do you think make it to like a third date? I'm going to assume that the fact that you got the second is pretty good. So to half. How many things make it from like first to second? Yeah, that's probably really low. Yeah. I always look at, I, I've been saying this for years. There's so many parallels to interviewing and dating and the things that happen. I remember arguing with people on LinkedIn about this. And uh, you could never have like, you never have an open-minded debate on LinkedIn and always like, yourself i stopped posting there because the people are like oh you're an idiot you're stupid i'm like yeah because there's absolutely no parallels to meeting a complete stranger for the first time and and trying to figure out who they are there's just nothing nothing similar <laughs> like uh it, it sounded like someone that as arguing with someone that probably went on a lot of first interviews and they never made it to a second right so i don't know um but i look at that same thing of you're meeting a stranger for the first time, you know, <laughs> wait a minute, not always, you know, I, I've had people show up to interviews dressed like bums and sandals, looking like they just came from the beach and I like, didn't take care of their hair, smell like alcohol, weed. <laughs> You've had a whole bunch of people over the years show up to first interviews that you think they were going to put their best foot forward, right? But they don't. I'm sure you're experienced that. I mean, without a doubt. Without a doubt. So, but you think on a first date or a first interview that this is supposed to be the best image of, uh, that someone's going to portray themselves. They're going to close their back from the dry cleaner. They got the fresh haircut. Um, everything's you know tightened up. We're setting up straight. We're we're not cussing unless you're me. <laughs> you, know, <laughs> you know, it's it, this is a. Uh, the most polished version. And I always joke about the dating cuts. Like first date, everyone looks sharp. Second date, same thing. Everyone's usually pretty sharp. Third date, maybe things get toned down a little bit. Maybe put a little less effort into the clothes. And, you know, and then three months in, everyone's chilling in sweatpants and you're at home eating pizza and shit. And uh, so it's like that. It's not that that first person, that first inter- the first date wasn't a realistic view. It just was not the portrayal of what you're going to get every single day. And that's kind of why I look at interviewing. It's they're on their best behavior. They got the best answers for everything. And, you know, it's like, okay, but what are you going to be like? When we get to the sweatpants phase, what are you going to be like three months from now? And I think that's what we're trying to figure out somewhere between that first and like third interview. And how easy have you have you found that to be king? It, it's nearly impossible. And it's nearly impossible. So, but you know, we hear that phrase, and I've been hearing this phrase, you know, my whole life: the fast to hire. Ah, I always say that. You know, slow to hire, fast to fire thing. It's one of those sayings that's been around forever. And uh, you, you had that thing where you have a really great first interview, and you just want to like, you just want to pull a trigger. Like, they, this is it. I know. I got my gut feeling. What was it? Blink. Trust your gut. Whatever the hell that book was. Like, I'm doing it. And then you do it. And then it's six weeks in. You're like, God damn it. Yeah. And uh, I, I also know it gets to the point where I, like doing 10 interviews isn't going isn't gonna to solve the problem either, right? It's, you know, it, it seems like two to four interviews, depending if you got multiple levels of management, who needs to see them? Does the president need to see them? HR, the department leads, all this stuff. Um, you don't want it to take too long. You don't want to make it seem like you're, you make things difficult or you're not organized or you're not motivated to make a hire. But I, I don't know if very rarely does just hiring someone on the spot work out well. Yeah. True. True. And on the flip side, 
and I, I think a lot of people don't like hearing this when, when they hear, you know, fast to fire, they think of, you know, heartless or you're not a good person or you're a bad company. And I think when, when people say that, that should come with the asterisk of someone should know that they were doing a bad job. Right. And assuming the management's been like working with them and co it's when someone gets let go, unless they're just really doing bad things, then there's not a choice. Typically a company will, I've already communicated to the person that you're not meeting the bar, right? There's, there's been talks, there's been conversations. You might've been put on a pip. Um, but you can't let that go on for six months. Um, especially if that person's like poisoning other people around them, which I think a lot of companies have learned, you know, since COVID, you know, attitudes have really changed in the workplace. And you, you know, I talked to some of these people in the larger companies and, you know, one person can drag a 40 person department down. So you, can you let that person sit there for 12 months trying to drag everyone into the hole with them, for example? Um, what are your thoughts on this? Well, I, I really like a line that you have in your portion of this chapter where you talk about it being a disservice to that individual to allow them to continue to fail. Right? It's, it, you're wasting their time as much as it, it's painful for your internal team to have to deal with that individual. Um, because you could actually, you know, cut them loose and maybe they go find something that they're actually good at. So, um, yeah, the fast to fire part is actually filled with empathy when you, when you think about both sides of the equation. Um, it helps the, the organization, of course, because it's empathetic to the, to the 39 people in that 40-person department. And it's empathetic towards that individual who is just not doing a great job. And no, I, you know, I'd like to think that nobody likes to go into work every single day and, and not feel like they're doing a great job or feel like they cannot achieve eventually what they need to achieve. So I really like that line that you put in that, in that chapter, James, or around it being a disservice to that person. I mean, look, it, they're obviously not happy. Right, it's you're coming into work every day not happy, and there's something else out there for you where you might find success or that's going to make you happy. Why not? You did let's part ways, right? Um, it's not like trying to convince yourself that you're really doing something good, it's just sometimes there's these things that they're, they're not good or bad, but they have to happen. It's it's just not working out for either side. And there's been times when, you know, another Fortune 500 buddy I was talking to, it's, you know, he let somebody go and he had about, you know, 10 people approach him saying, like, we've been waiting for you to do that. And you, you, you don't realize that it's not just like this productivity or whatever issues, you know, as a manager you have with this one person. Like, you don't realize that you know, within a, within a 20 foot circle of this one person, there, you, 10 other people were not happy coming to work. And now you, you were risking losing those people because of that one person, right? It's, the, the, can you just say like, this isn't for you? And it, it's, you know, it's go find something where you are happy, where you get the feeling of success, where you want to go to work every day. This obviously isn't it. But it's you really got to look at this like contagion aspect of it. It's, it's not just the manager not wanting to deal with this person. It's it's the whole department or sometimes the whole company. And you know, no matter how much effort you put in the hiring, you're always going to make a bad hire. But you know, you can't let someone sit there for two years and let let everything rot from the inside out. That contagion aspect is really important because you you can you can imagine a scenario where you know, you're, you're a team of 40, there's 39 good eggs and, and one bad egg, so to speak. And the, as for as long as you put up with the actions or the in, inadequacy or the underperformance of that one individual, the rest of the team will just say like, well, if you're going to put up with that, why, why the hell do I need to work hard? Or why do I put in more effort than, than that? Because that person's still here, right? And, and underperforming. So absolutely, the contagion aspect is important.
Yeah, and I, you you know, obviously through Daggerfin, you do surveys and you're getting the the pulse of the workforce, and you know, sometimes you get those comments in the boxes of, of things like you know, management has has no backbone, management has no spine, and you know, people will leave comments saying things like, yeah, there, there's people here that, that that shouldn't be here right now, and yeah, double standards. Yeah, there's a lot of things you end up, and it's your team is waiting for you to do something and as you're collecting the survey data it's like this is an eye opener and like you know you have a problem but you don't know how far that problem reaches and it's you know you don't want to deal with that problem well everyone else out there's got to deal with that person every day and um i know it's tough but at the same time that who the hell wants to go to work and then be surrounded by like these people that are just combative and difficult to work with they don't get their stuff done or they're constantly trying to undermine you and backstab and talk behind your back and it's who no one wants to work with that person so you can't let them sit there for two years it, i know everyone hates when like companies let people go but just as there's, there are bad managers out there and there are there, there's bad companies but there also are bad employees sometimes and uh like, you know, it doesn't do anyone good to like, continue a relationship that's not good for either side. Yeah. Yeah, I, I completely... But the, talk a little bit about your experience with, with clicks, James, because in, in your portion of the of the chapter, you mentioned like the idea that typically when one person leaves, you can find this contagion where two or three will leave. Yeah, so we've been in, you know, recruiting for 25 years. And yeah, I'm using my clients' examples, and though, well, even on the anything on the outplacement side through Employment Booster, to the recruiting side, you know, you'll talk to clients, and they'll have that issue where you know we're replacing somebody. You know, they they had to let somebody go. We're bringing a you know a new senior buyer in or somebody for a, a customer, and all of a sudden. With not all of a sudden, but let's just say within the next sixty days, they'll send us two more job orders for senior buyers. And so we went from like one senior buyer to three senior buyer, and it's like, okay, what happened there? Well, the person they let go, you know, they're all they're all in the same department. The person they let go was, you know, kind of toxic, and they they let that person go because they're very negative. Well, they they we're able to like draw people into their, into their bullshit. Right. And of course this person gets let go. What do they do? They're at home still, you know, mad at the company and they're texting away to their other two buddies. And, you know, eventually ends up getting two more people to leave. And I've seen this many times over 25 years where, you know, it, it starts with someone getting let go. They got to fill a role. We go fill the role. And then there's roles in the same department or, or adjacent to that department. And it's, I always say when we get a phone call from a customer, a lot of times it's not going to be for one search. This is going to end up resulting in three, four or five searches because, you know, someone was let go and it's going to be this trickle down effect of this person affected who knows how many people, right? And Maybe they affected 10 people, but only three are going to leave. So I always found that interesting. And I mean, I seen it when I was consulting in places. I, I consulted in some very large companies. And you saw the little clicks of people. And there were like the, the people that just got stuff done, that top 20%. They were kind of on their own thing. And then there was those people that always went down to the cafeteria together. And they weren't talking about like getting better and taking out a class and a book and new ideas, they would just, they would go down there for 45 minutes at the cafeteria and didn't just shit on everybody. <laughs> and if one of the, one of those people leave, they'll, they'll all end up leaving at some point. So it's, I mean, something I've experienced for over two decades, right? But the longer you let that person sit there, the more people they drag into it. <laughs> and then, you know, you you could be someone that's had a perfectly good relationship with your manager. And if you're around someone who is constantly talking negative, they'll make you believe that that manager's terrible, even though your personal experience has been fine. Yeah, yeah, that's key. 
And because I've seen friends do that shit. And I'm like, and I'm like, Mike, like, I've, I've never heard you talk like that. It seems like you've been getting your, your raises, your bumps, your, you're getting title bumps. You seem happy. You, uh, and you realize that, you know, the, this other per John has been influencing Mike. And then it's like, well, you know, well, Mike just screwed his career up, you know, because he, he got sucked into someone else's like, it, it can't at some point it just wears you down. It's like, it's like that water dripping on a rock. You ever see that thing of here's this rock and then here's this rock that's been having a drop of water on it every day for 10,000 years. Mm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a torture mechanism. It, sooner or later, that rock gets broken down from the water and you realize as much as people say they can think for themselves and they're, they're strong and they, they ignore all the BS, it's on a long enough timeline, everyone gets worn down. And then it's like, all right, Mike, you're basically telling me that all your experiences with your boss has been fine, but you don't like the way that he's treating Johnny. <laughs> <clears throat> and it's like, well, does John always get his work done on time? You know, you start asking questions and it's like, well, no, it sounds like John's bringing a bunch of heat on himself. It's just the longer you let John sit there, the more people he's going to poison and almost get, almost get people to feel sorry for him. And so when he gets let go, they, you know, people get pissed off. Oh my God, they should have done that. That was wrong. Even though they've never seen the HR file of all the stuff John's got written up for. They only know John's side of the story. And then the next thing you know, two or three other people leave. So it's, uh, it's not that uncommon when something like that happens. I expect a few more people to leave. Yep. Makes total sense. So I guess well, we can probably close it out. If you were, I mean, I write a little bit about maybe fit and values and adaptability, but in your experience, what should you look for uh, when, when people are hiring? When, when you, we say hire, hire the right ones, what, what do you typically look for? I think a lot of times we, you know, I look at interview when you design an interview process, which I think is probably the biggest mistake I see most companies do. They don't even have an interview process. They grab some, some questions off the internet. The hiring manager has never been trained and how to hire. If they do have questions, they don't know why they're asking them. Um, there's always two components to me. There's, and sometimes three, if, if, if it's a complicated role, it's a, if you have a complex engineering role. The most critical aspect is, do you actually have the education experience and skills to do this job? Right. Right. The technical capacity. Right. right. Do you have the technical capacity? Okay. Check. And then it's, you know, the behavioral aspects that are going to make you really succeed in this role. You know, uh, have an open mind, being detail oriented. Uh, got all these things that maybe you have the mental alchemy to do the engineering role, but do you have the, the behavioral traits to really succeed in this role long term? Or, you know, are you going to, you know, if you're sloppy in this role, you're going to make mistakes and then, you know, over an 18 month period, it's not going to work out because these mistakes have cost us a customer, for example. So there's the technical aspect of it. There's the behavioral and personality aspect that branches over into like culture. And let's just say our culture is about, um, you know, teamwork, being kind to each other, working extremely hard, um, trying to really grow this business and, and trying to uplift other people around us. And, you know, if you're someone that just wants to sit at your desk, not talk to anybody, not bring anyone else up around you, don't share no ideas or be, be combative or an asshole. Well, I don't want to come work with you. And, um, so like, you know, depending on the type of role, you can have two buckets, three buckets, four buckets. And obviously you need to do the job, be able to do the job. And then there's, I start looking at these other two buckets where I think companies fail. A lot of times they're only focused on, do you have the ability from a technical aspect or experience to actually do the job? Okay, you do. And then they get in there and then no one likes working with this person. The team doesn't want to follow them. The other managers don't want to work with them. And it's like, well, what do you do now? You know, and it's, 
you're going to have to go back and hire somebody else. Um, I will say like things have changed. I always say there's like this bucket of probably 1990 up till about 2005. I'll, I'll stretch it till, you know, I was obviously very young in 1990. I'm using a broad generalization here. That 20 year period of 1990 to like, 2010, where I felt people were really chasing career growth, ambition, motivated. It was, it was very different employing people. And then even being an employee, like I worked for other people in my past. It was different. And I would say from 2010 up to COVID, things started to change. They really accelerated once COVID came, right? And it's, and then you see this on the surveys, right? You've seen how the attitudes of employees have changed, their opinions of work, their opinions of managers, and, you know, trying to, trying to hire people right now that when they do come into the office, that you find them enjoyable. I mean, Kane, do you want to come in and with, with 10 people every day that you just can't stand? No, of course not. Of course not. Nobody wants that. And, you know, it, it seems like since COVID, people are way more combative. People do seem angrier. They don't seem as happy. And um, so how do you find that when you hire someone right now? How do you get the person that, you know, has the ability to do the job? that has the behavioral traits that, to make them, you know, successful long-term and then say, Hey man, I would love to go to happy hour with you, you know, throw back a Coke and some chicken wings and just BS. <laughs> it's, it's hard. It's hard yeah. now. And because that same person, like the saying that always rings in my head and it's probably a bad example. Um, it's, you know, you, you don't cook with the wine you wouldn't, wouldn't ever just want to have a glass of. Does that make any sense to you? Like, don't cook with the bad wine. You know, you, you, people think if I'm gonna if I'm gonna cook with the wine, I'll just buy some cheap wine. Right, right, right. And I'm not saying use expensive wine, but you would if if the wine doesn't taste good right out of the bottle, then why do you think it's gonna taste good in the rest? Hmm, makes sense. In that same sense of you know that whole if, if I don't want to go to happy hour, if I couldn't tolerate you at happy hour over over some you know, edamame, right? Because you know how much green stuff I eat. Then why would I want to, why would I want to tolerate you in the office 40 hours a week? And you start thinking of, you know, is this someone I want to spend time with? And not even me personally, Kane, it's, it's when you put a group of people together, could you see that, okay, this is going to be a fun team. You know, they're going to get along. They're going to BS. They're going to crack some jokes. They're going to uplift each other. They're going to motivate each other. They're going to feed off each other, right? It's, they're going to they'll learn from each other. They're going to up their game. And it's, and I always say, like, if I couldn't spend time with you at happy hour, why do I want to spend 40 hours locked in this box with you? So, yeah. yeah. A lot of times I think we're looking at, we're short staffed. I need someone to do the job. And sometimes you have no choice. You know, I know we're going to, we're going to put a report out here one of these days for Daggerfin. Or um, around data surrounding the, you know, the, when you ask executives or even department managers, are you, are you carrying people on your payroll right now that you don't want to because you have to? That data is, is saying that most people are carrying people that they, because they don't have a choice. Like if they had access to better candidates right now, they would have already let these people go, right? Um, so I know your back is against the wall sometimes. I know hospitality is very, they're struggling with that everywhere right now. It's, you have a really poor service experience. If you say something to the manager, he was like, I would love to find someone friendlier to be a server. And then I, I put the thing out and I get no applications, right? So, okay, your back's against the wall. You gotta, you gotta hire anybody that can do the job. And I think once you get to a position, maybe through stronger employer branding, maybe you're hiring headhunters where you get candidate flow, find someone that can do the job, but don't lose sight of that cultural aspect. It's like, well, would the team actually want to spend the time in the office working with this person? And I don't know if companies are doing a great job of that right now, unless you disagree. No, I, I do not disagree. That, that sounds exactly right. So, 
we could do this one forever because this is what every company's struggling with. Like we could talk for two hours on the topic of yeah. designing. You know, we we've done that. We'll go design interview questions, interview processes, trying to figure out why are you asking this question, what answer are you looking for, you know, behavioral or are they a good fit? I mean, there's also tests, there's the Hogan test, there's there's things out there you can do to try to help match the personality side of it. But it's like the culture side, it's you know, how many times have you gone and done a culture engagement? And, you know, it's it's going to take you two years to do that, right, Kane? And then mm-hmm. if they would have hired the right people culturally from the beginning, hell, you wouldn't even be there, right? It, I mean, it it goes back to the, the one of the early points we made around allowing people to sit too long and just poisoning the pool. Yeah, so... You're going to lose a bunch of people. Your employees are now more negative. You're going to have to replace those people and hire someone to come change your culture. Man, it's really goddamn expensive to let that person <laughs> sit around. <laughs> exactly. So, anyways, anything else to close us out? No, I think we covered it pretty well. On to yeah. chapter six. You know what chapter six is? I forgot. I don't. Let me pull it up. At times, I, I, I keep people, I get messages all the time. I get texts, I get emails, I get Instagram messages, TikTok messages, and they'll, people will send me like a screenshot of the book, like a chapter, or they'll actually write out a quote that, Kane, I don't remember writing. <laughs> um, but you know me, I, I blurt all this stuff out. And you know, I think that last episode, you'll, you sent me an article on Hertz about the 20,000 electric cars. I'm like, I did? <laughs> and I had, I'm sitting just scrolling through my phone. I'm like, oh yeah, it's you consume so much content every day, or you know, we we write so much stuff that yeah, it sounds like something I would say. I just don't don't remember doing it. Well, chapter six is around uh, how you can't build a culture without a cult, so it'll be a good one to discuss because I think it's somewhat controversial. I don't know if it's controversial, but. It's the, it's the last part of this conversation where we talked about finding those people that actually want to be, you know, we're all in the same room for 40 hours. I actually don't, you know, the people that'll say, um, if there's like a giveaway in the company, like, oh, the three top producers get to go to Cancun. And then you'll see a bunch of comments on a, on a TikTok post that say, I don't want to go anywhere with my coworkers. It's, <laughs> you know, I get that. But at the same time, it's. I've watched over 25 years, you know, some of my best friends came from places I worked. Right. I've watched many people end up finding a spouse at their place of work, you know, over the years. And some of their best friends and their network has come from work. And you realize it's, all right, maybe you don't want to go to Cancun with these people because you don't like any of them. But if you had the right culture slash cult, you would say, I don't mind spending three days with you on the beach. Yeah. That's true. And uh, so we'll talk about that more in the next episode. We will. All right. Catch you in the next one.